All right, and then we'll go. All right, welcome. Um, so, hi, uh, my name is Erin Corcoran. I am a architect, the building kind, um, and a design strategist. And we'll get into what that second half means um, as I go through the talk tonight. Um, I am broadcasting live from my living room in East Boston. I'm very close to the wall because there's a dining table like right here, and then that is it. Um, couch, the end. Um, and as far as sort of just sort of meeting the etiquette, um, if you can stay on mute, that would be great, but feel free to keep your camera on. I'm going to cycle through every so often because part of the reason I enjoy giving talks is because I enjoy people. So this is an interesting time. So feel free to occasionally nod or just sit in shock. Um, if you find something funny, you can do a delayed laugh. I'll be fine. Um, so a uh, little bit of background. Um, I work for a firm called Gensler, um, which is a global architectural firm. Um, we also do interiors and uh, environmental graphics and all sorts of other related designs. Um, I am a licensed architect in both Ontario and Massachusetts. I am from Canada and I'm a grad of the University of Waterloo, which I know a lot of people on this call will know, uh, even though in Massachusetts practicing architecture, a lot of people haven't heard of that school, but I know within the tech community, it's pretty well known. Um, one fun fact about the picture in the bottom left of this slide, um, that sign was one of my earliest projects um, before I was registered. It's one of the few things I can Google and show people. But the funniest part is the image that they continue to use for their uh, branding is before it was finished. You can see a couple pylons in the background and there's a nice cover that went over all of the bolts under the letters. So that continues to amuse me to this day every time I get an email from my alma mater uh, with an old picture of my sign on it. Um, so what are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, so I'll do a little bit of an introduction into UX or user design and how it's interacting in the field. And then we're going to go through some of the tools that we used, uh, half uh, quantitative um, tools and a couple project anecdotes and how the findings from those studies are rolling into how we design. And then also the qualitative aspects and how it applies. And then to finish off, um, originally I was going to do something about uh, the future of design and how this is rolling in, but obviously this is an interesting time. So a little bit of musings on the pandemic and its impact, impact on shared spaces and kind of what's on our minds these days. Uh, there will be some live polling as part of it. So have your phone handy or another tab open in the browser. Um, instructions will pop up on the questions. So, All right, let's get into it. So first off, an introduction. I hate blank pages. I am not the type of architect uh, who is able to just think up uh, ideas out of nowhere. I've always needed constraints. I've always needed inspiration from context or my clients or the people inhabiting it or the existing conditions. Um, coincidentally, um, I've been working in architecture for uh, probably 12 or 13 years now, and I have never worked on a greenfield or a brand new project. All of my projects have been renovations um, or alterations or existing conditions. Also, I've never gotten to blow anything up, which maybe someday. Um, but it's helpful as someone that needs context to start. So my favorite projects are the ones that start and end with the users and with the project context in mind. So I firmly believed, and I'm very biased on this, that understanding user needs and use patterns, building designs can be more informed and completed spaces can work better. They can be more intuitive, they can be more welcoming, they can let people know that they can come into the space and inhabit it. So the pictures you're seeing up here are a library project I worked on a while ago where we did a lot of work on the children's area of the library, trying to get the furniture to work with how they played, how they wanted to be within the space, and also how parents wanted their kids to be able to sort of work independently, but still have really good sight lines. So this was, again, it was earlier in my career, so I can firmly say I mainly just worked on this desk, um, but at the same time trying to make it so that children had options to sort of interact with the space, but also it was in a location that was bright and welcoming, but also functioned very well from a parental aspect as well. 
I'm also fascinated by how humans interact with space. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call are fascinated by how humans interact with everything, um, with tech um, and our environments and how we move through the world. But I am particularly get excited about the surprising way that buildings are adapted after constructions, um, how spaces change over time, and the unique behaviors, the sort of unexpected behaviors that come out in space, for better or worse, but it, it's part of why I really enjoy cities, urban spaces, public spaces, because that's where you're going to run into people doing things that you didn't expect within the space or using it in different ways. And I'm always curious about those factors that make buildings sort of feel right. There's spaces that we're drawn to as humans. This can be a pretty nostalgic slide for a lot of people trapped in our homes. Um, but like some of my favorite spaces within Boston in particular are the Greenway. Um, it's the kind of space where you don't even need to go there. You're going somewhere else, but you change your path to walk through it just to see what people are doing because it's this breath within the city. It just sort of draws you in. And then also I'm curious about what elements make spaces unwelcoming or undesirable. So the study on the bottom right is, I think it's actually out of the School of Psychology at University of Waterloo, but it's someone who's measuring people's stress responses as they walk through cities. And a lot of his research, um, it's Colin Allard, a lot of his research has gone into when you have spaces that are sort of flat and monotone and sort of unapproachable materials as opposed to crenellated or they sort of come out into the space or pull back, people tend to walk faster, people tend to move through the space um, and not want to linger. And it also, he's documented that it causes a stress response in city building, which is just fascinating work. And then getting into UX and strategy, um, a strategic approach is becoming more common in architecture. So architecture has always been client focused. Um, it's a service industry. It started from patronages. Um, we wouldn't get uh, architects can't afford to build city halls, so we work for our clients. Um, but more recently, um, data-based decisions are increasing just across the board in all industries, and our clients are more often asking for us to prove our assumptions or test our decisions, or they want us to benchmark against what other people are doing or engage with their users. So what you're seeing on the screen is just sort of a couple clips of projects um, the one on the right is actually some research that we've been doing um, at Gensler as far as what amenities within a workspace might give you the most bang for the buck when it comes to how well people rate the experience. Um, so if you're going to add some sort of amenity to your space, what might bring up uh, your experience scores higher? Um, the middle one is benchmarking. So it's square foot per person across industries. Um, again, these are workplace uh, office designs. And then the top one is uh, a student center that we were working on. Um, and we were just trying to understand for uh, sort of financial aid and um, admissions, those sorts of departments, what does their day-to-day -day look like? How much time are they spending at the counter? How much time are they spending with students? How much time do they need private space so that we can try to determine what sort of space they need? All right, and then some of this I might get wrong, um, but uh, UX, UI, so user experience, user interactions for any architects on the line, um, terminology is spreading into the architectural field, even as our vocabulary is passing into yours. Um, before we got started, um, there was a little bit of conversation around the title architect and how that's sort of bleeding across industries. Definitely um, within our practice these days, we're hearing unprompted people saying things like we want the space to be frictionless or intuitive. We have some retail clients that are actually doing something akin to A-B testing where they'll set up um, a retail space in one way, see how people move, move through it, see what their sales are like, and then actually reconfigure it and try it again. It's not quite as easy to do as typical A-B testing, um, but we try. 
And then uh, understanding heat maps and personas, journey mapping, user experience, all these terms are things that are popping up more and more in the architectural design field. As we're noticing the terms sort of architect mock-ups, prototypes, design thinking, running charrettes, generative design, these are all things that have been in uh, the design profession for a long time that are also emerging um, in your field. So what does a UX study look like when it comes into the context of uh, building designs? So um, first off to note, uh, we don't tend to use the term UX a lot. Um, typical terms that you might hear on the architectural side is human-centric design, user-based design, design strategy, even consulting um, or experience strategy, but so most of the time it's just referred to as design. Yes, we're engaging the users, we're doing more research studies, um, but we're not necessarily calling it UX. Um, and the studies we tend to do um, generally bucket up into these four. There's some nuances around that, but for example, we'll do a high level study. So that would be without a current project, there's no build, particular building on the board. It might be more pure market analysis or research, or it might be master planning. When we tend to do those more sort of thought exercise, it might be planning out a district or a city or a campus. Um, the second one and probably the most common is program development and that's where we're trying to figure out what are the puzzle pieces that go together to make the building. Um, we might know, say we're designing a library, we might know that there's stacks in a check-in area and a staff lounge in a children's zone, but we'll work with the users to figure out if we're missing anything else to develop that kit of parts so that we can start drawing out plans. Um, the next one is kind of a quick hit or a gut check. I couldn't think of a more professional sounding name for this one. Um, but generally it's in a project that's already running where you might hit on a tricky problem or an assumption where you're like, I think this is the right thing to do, but maybe we should do some secondary research or maybe we should check in with the users or go to a couple completed projects and see what was done there. It's more solving a particular item so that you can move forward with the design. And a few of the examples I've got tonight are sort of examples of those sort of quick hit studies. Um, and then the last one is a post-occupancy study, which would be after you've completed the project, everybody's moved in, coming back and doing an analysis, maybe using some of the same tools that you use during the design phase to sort of check your work, see what's working, see what you didn't anticipate, and then depending on the project, maybe make some alterations, or if you're thinking about a phase two, uh, bring some of those findings into the study. Uh, note that uh, program development is definitely the most common. Post-occupancy is exceedingly rare. Um, we tend to only do post-occupancy studies if there actually is a phase two or another project, or if it's a client that we're doing rolling work for, um, mainly because uh, buildings take a long time. You might be in design for a year or a year and a half. The building might take a couple of years to build. And by the time you actually get everyone moved in and everything's working and the doors all locked properly and the water's running, the last thing that anyone wants is to come in and do a study. Um, so that tends to be why post-occupancy doesn't happen as often, though sometimes we'll come back a few years later um, if there's some, something that they're looking to study or change. All right. Um, so moving on, uh, talking about the tools. So there's a variety of tools. Uh, there are more than these eight, but these are kind of the bigger buckets that I'll go through tonight. Um, they bucket up into quantitative, so more database tools, um, and qualitative, which is more sort of empathy or people focused um, or co-creation. So I'm gonna run through all eight. There will be a poll coming up, so just be prepared because I'm super curious with an audience that's fairly diverse. As I'm going into this, just as a baseline, um, if you guys are able to respond, I highly recommend the web link. It seems to be generally way more stable than the text. Um, just to see in the audience, sort of what of these tools have you heard of or used so that I know which ones to maybe go into in a bit more detail or to add. And just while we're responding, if anybody has questions about the intro, feel free to turn on your mic because we'll be pausing here for a second as is. 
I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of surveys. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll let that run for a bit. Definitely surveys, it's, it, it's funny because uh, having worked both for an architecture firm that does a lot of this work and in my previous, as soon as surveys became publicly available, it became a very consistent ask regardless of the project type. It seemed to be like, oh, we should send out a survey, we should do a survey. So I definitely hear from my architectural colleagues about I don't feel qualified to design a survey or analyze the results or am I picking good questions um, but the clients are asking for it and in some cases the clients are doing it themselves um, before the architect is even hired and then focus groups for sure journey mapping sensors awesome I know there's still people going so I'll give it a minute okay Activity analysis is one of my favorites, so that's good. I, I will definitely dig into that. Because we can't track eye movements for some reason in real space. So, okay. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. All right, we'll see. Okay, so quantitative. Definitely had to check twice to make sure I had the right one. Um, so existing data, let's start with the basics. Um, so when we're looking at existing data, we don't necessarily have a stream of how many people have logged on, how long they've been on the page, um, how many times they tried to do a particular thing, etc. I'm making generalizations about a field I don't know very much about. Apologies. Um, so some of the existing data that exists um, for architecture, especially when it comes to workplace design, which is a lot of my work. Um, as an aside, part of the reason workplace is a lot of my work is because the incentives are just right for a client that's designing an office to want to make database decisions. So they're looking at a business plan, they're trying to think, hey, what type of space, how many square foot do I have to buy, will my people be more productive, and generally a lot of design strategy has been born from workplace due to that need. Um, so batch swipe data, this is um, if you're coming into your building in the morning and you're using a key card, um, obviously it's recorded, it's ex when you, some businesses have you tap out as well, but it's existing data that's available and for quite a few of our clients, um, it'll help us determine sort of what your maximum population might be on any given day or occasionally we'll be doing breakdowns by department um, to determine sort of how much space they might need, how many rooms they might need. Um, the example I've got up here is actually um, Microsoft calls this peak average attendance and they actually use badge swipe data to determine the sizes of all of their new offices and they have been doing this for a number of years. Um, so what's interesting is we'll do, we'll talk about activity analysis in a minute, which gives you more nuance as far as where are people going once they come in. But you can actually get a lot of findings based on when people are coming in, when people are going out, as far as what your max loads are that you need to plan for, or what your average population is on any given day. Um, and what's interesting with Microsoft is they've actually used this, especially with their sales teams, which are out of the office a lot of the time. Um, to do shared seating arrangements. So they'll look at a couple years worth of data to see how often people are coming in. And then they'll use a calculation to determine how many seats they would need and then those seats are shared. Um, having done uh, some change management work with Microsoft, what's really interesting is now that they've been doing this and publishing this for a number of years, all of the employees will self articulate like I don't hold doors open, I make sure to tap my card um, so that I know that we're getting the right amount of space. But because they're very open as far as this is the data that we use, at least the clients know, uh, sorry, the clients, the occupants know that and they know the importance of sort of tapping in and out. Um, other existing data that we use probably less often, um, but there's been a, a few projects this has come up on is Wi-Fi pings. Um, so this is uh, an existing library. This is uh, just a dashboard sort of showing over time um, which routers and what time of, type of user has logged on, whether they're staff, a visitor, 
for a student and the time of day. So this was determining sort of within the existing space, which areas were more popular and also what times of day were people using it. So there wasn't a lot of good data to vet assumptions as far as the students are always studying super late on a Thursday or they really enjoy these spaces or everyone's really spread out or it's packed. And so the Wi-Fi data, which was there already, and because it was a university where you have to log on to it with your student uh, number, it was a good sort of amalgam to determine kind of peak loading. But of course, knowing Wi-Fi routers, you're just getting a sense of the area and the time of day and number of users, as opposed to exactly where they are or what they're doing. Okay, surveys. So everyone knows surveys, so I won't get into it in too much detail. Um, but uh, Gensler does a lot of research um, related to workplace design because we do a lot of workplace design. So we do a large study now running every year, it used to be every three years, looking at how people work over time and how the way that we work has changed over time. Um, so one of the key findings more recently, and I present this mainly because a lot of us do work in offices, and I find it comforting to know that we are studying how to design these spaces better. Um, but generally what we're seeing is over time, a focus where the amount of time of day you're spending working alone versus working for others has shifted. So we're working less by ourselves, not today in our house. Um, but in a workplace, we're working less by ourselves and we're working more with each other. Um, but what's interesting is we also find that that impacts sort of working with each other is not necessarily compatible with focus work. So what we found over time is that the, the workspaces that score the best, so people say that they can work effectively, there are spaces to support their needs, are the ones that provide options. So that's where this variety in choice comes in. So. This study isn't based on our designs or our work. It's a, um, it's a wider study that we use a recruiting form to get that wide demographics. But at the same time, what's interesting is to know that the spaces that provide choices, so you might have a private space that you can use sometimes or at your desk, as opposed to having to do everything at your desk, are the ones that tend to score higher. And that's definitely, when we see sort of really good workplace design, it's that you have plenty of options so that you can choose where you want to work as opposed to having to configure how you work to the only space that you have available. And then similar to that, this is from this past year's study. Sorry, it's probably a little small on the screen. Um, but generally, we're seeing the higher performing, so having a better experience and being um, more effective for work are generally more open spaces, despite the studies that are coming out related to open office design, which we can totally get into later. Um, but again, it's that variety. So the ones that get the best scores for experience and for effectiveness are those mostly open space, so daylit with room, but with private spaces that are available on demand, as opposed to the totally open spaces that get generally lower scores, less effectiveness, because you just don't have any other options. Okay, and then the holy grail for us for some of these workplace uh, surveys is occasionally we'll do projects where we can work with the IT teams to track the response IP addresses to their location or seat within the office. And then we can see, are there any differentiations as far as where this person is sitting versus how they're rating the workplace design? And yes, the two findings that are on the screen are very, um, you could probably guess without having to measure it. Um, people like to be closer to daylight and people like to be away from louder traffic corridors or print areas, etc. But without being able to actually say like, yes, we can prove this, sometimes it's harder to fight for the importance of proper zoning away from loud areas or trying to get daylight to every desk. Okay, so different types of surveys. Again, I'll go through these a little quicker because we all know how these work. Um, but other ways that we've used survey tools to try to inform space design. 
Um, this one was an inspiration tour. So it was like a six question survey. Um, it was a uh, sort of fast casual restaurant uh, client that was looking to create a new type of experience um, with some concept stores. So we actually took them, I didn't get to go on these trips, but it's a project that Gensler has done. Um, we uh, took them to New York, San Francisco and Seattle um, to a variety of public spaces and sort of had them rate what aspects of the experience do they really enjoy? What's the most important? And then sort of did daily downloads where we went through the results from their surveys while they were in the space and just tried to determine like what were the really key parts that differentiated these experiences and really struck home with them as a way to set the baseline for the design of a new concept. Okay, and then this slide actually changed a bit because COVID. Um, Usually I end the survey portion by saying, yes, everyone's asking us to do surveys, but no one wants to do surveys anymore. Um, people, like even if it's down to like two questions, no one wants to do a survey. Um, so we have had some clients where we've tried to get a similar sort of wide spectrum of random results, but in other ways. Um, so this one is a hospital um, where we actually set up sort of drawing boards that people uh, could respond sort of what do you want the experience moving around the hospital to be like in the future? We put another one in the cafeteria. What do you want the experience around eating to be? And this is fairly qualitative, but um, you can see sort of on the bottom one, there's some clips on it. These pages filled extremely quickly and we actually ended up replacing them multiple times. Um, just because a lot of people really wanted to engage with the boards. Um, we definitely put it out around Halloween and I definitely regret giving children Sharpies in a public building. Um, but there was definitely people that were engaged with the boards and sort of interacted with it. Um, and we got a lot of really good responses that we could balance against some of the more um, smaller group work that we were doing to vet like, does this seem right? Um, for a client that absolutely did not want to do anything digital. Um, and my favorite response is in the bottom right. This is when we had it in a children's waiting room and Animos is uh, probably my favorite survey response. Um, actually, I'll just pause here for a sec. So the second half of the story is in a post COVID working remotely world is we've had some focus groups that we have now pitched to do digitally in person with webcams and be all interactive. And we have had clients go, the last thing my people want is to be on a webcam in a meeting. Please give us a survey. <laughs> so it, it's interesting that the ability to choose the time that you engage with the activity now is seen as much more valuable than the in-person sort of digital interaction. So maybe we could have sent you the talk and put a survey after, but it's just interesting to see so swift a reversal. Um, so this is what the findings looked like. Um, this was a much larger study that included a lot of focus groups and interviews and sort of walks through the space. But um, the way that those results kind of came together and how it worked its way into a master plan is we took all of the comments from the boards, all of the comments from the focus groups and the ideas that uh, we had done in some of our sessions and sort of created this giant map of uh, everything we heard, but then what it bubbled up into and then it bubbles up into themes. And then as we did options for the master plan for this hospital, we were able to overlay some of those items and give scores based on each of the options of how well it met each of the experience goals. So it takes those fairly qualitative aspects of I want animals in the children's area to more like I want things I can engage with um, at different levels and for different age groups and how can we create room in a master plan for those moments to happen. All right, activity analysis. Um, this one, I don't actually get to do that often, um, but I'm incredibly fascinated by the results every time we do one of these studies. Um, so this one is about measuring utilization. So what are, is the space occupied? What are people doing within the space? So um, it tends to be a workplace study. So it tends to be working on a computer, talking on the phone, uh, on a video call, eating, socializing, 
Uh, I think there's one for pausing if they don't fit into any of those categories or the space is unoccupied. And what we do is we take a floor plan and programming each of these stops. Um, we have an app uh, called Facility Quest that we use that works on iPads. So you, we program in each of the stops how many seats it has. And if it's a meeting room, um, it, the, when we run the study, it will ask how many people are in the room. So the information that we get out of it is what times of day are people using the space? How often is it occupied? Are the rooms the right size? Um, we see a lot of meeting room spaces where you'll have a 10 person room that's always being used for two person meetings. Um, and also what activities are people doing where? What we'll see a lot in older offices is that people are doing all activities at the desk, socializing, talking to others, having meetings, focusing. And what we'll see in sort of more modern office designs where you have options is that the louder activities tend to be in the cafe or open collaboration space, and then it tends to be quieter at the desk. And what, how this works is we actually um, will pay temp, uh, temps to go into the space. We train them up on the first day uh, with the iPads and then they basically do a loop around the office, sort of stopping at each location and it, it's like two or three clicks to input the information. And then they do a loop sort of every hour for a week um, or two weeks, depending on the site. So this is what the results look like. Um, this is a study, and I keep doing studies on places I've never been. This is a study we uh, ran remotely. It was an office in Seoul in South Korea. Um, so the, this was a post-occupancy study. So it was after the new office had opened and um, we were doing a one week utilization study. And the one thing to know about this office is that all it was a sales site and all of the seats were unassigned so when the office was designed they reduced the square footage and had the desks were to be shared and then it had a number of public spaces where you could sort of stop in and use your computer if the desks were full and sort of hang out so what was interesting is i'm going to show you two graphs this one is the average hourly utilization for the desk areas and what's interesting about this is the use pattern that you're seeing, it's time across the bottom, so like 8.30, 9, 9.30, 10 to 5 p.m. And it's whether someone was there or not is the graph. And then the color is based on what they were doing. So I did not bring the legend into this slide deck, but generally working on the computer is dark blue, eating is green, I think meeting with others is orange, and uh, gray is, there's evidence that someone is sitting here, but they're not here right now. So there might be a coffee cup or a sweater or something on the desk. So what's fascinating is this office had shared desks and the use pattern that you're seeing is a very typical use pattern for an owned desk. So like if one person is assigned to a space like your desk in a typical office, it'll probably look like this. 50% of the day you'll be sitting there working on your computer and the rest of the time you might be in a meeting or away from the office or having lunch and it tends to be 50% occupied. The second graph is their sort of small cafe pantry space. And what's interesting about the cafe space is we're seeing a lot of focus work, very minimal eating, which is the green, um, some meeting, but generally extremely full. Um, so 70% of the time, on average, every seat in their cafe is full. And those people are generally working on their computers trying to do focus work, which is not really what a cafeteria well, it's not even a cafe. It was like a cute little pantry with like a high top table and a coffee machine. It's not really made for you to be there a long time doing work. The other fascinating part over here on the right, this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, is on Monday, this space was 100% full for almost the entire day. Um, so it was interesting doing this remotely and because it's a utilization study, we don't know remotely exactly what behaviors might cause this, but we can guess. Um, a lot of the times when you go from a space where everyone sort of had their own space to a space where people are sharing desks, um, 
the sort of behaviors uh, to work around that are not always communicated to the people using the space or um, sometimes people will start to claim spaces. So that, that uh, gray area on the existing desks as far as like my jacket is here, my cup is here, or if it's a manager and a direct might not feel comfortable jumping onto that shared desk. So it, it's just interesting that you could go into the office on any day except for Monday and probably not even see this behavior. Um, but by doing that study in these loops, we can get sort of more nuance into this. All right, um, other ways that are coming out to measure um, sort of utilization. Um, this is a sensor that I'm sure everyone's been in a building where if you don't move enough, the lights go out. Um, so occupancy sensors save a lot of energy and we tend to put them in by default now. But it's a sensor that already exists and some of the lighting companies are providing dashboards now so we can see what times of day the lights, uh, the motion sensor was activated um, to as an amalgam to when our space is being used at what times of day. And then obviously sensors are a big thing for everyone these days, internet of things, all the buzzwords, all the things. Um, Steelcase is a furniture supplier. Um, they are starting to offer a product that uh, basically puts sensors in meeting rooms and um, desk spaces. It's kind of designed for an office or a WeWork where you wanna know when you come into the front door sort of what spaces are open. Um, but it also provides utilization data on an ongoing basis, both to provide data on how well the space is working, but also as a side benefit can also tell you when a meeting never started. So it's linked to their meeting room booking system. So if they know at like five minutes after the hour that no one entered the room and no and it's not being used, it will actually mark that room and sort of switch it in the room booking as available. So there's a number of kind of interesting side benefits. I, I still don't know how I feel about sensors, but at the same time as someone fascinated by utilization data, um, it would be a way to get sort of a continuous feed on how your space is being used. Uh, the last one's a little, uh, it's an MIT project. I. Uh, a year or so ago, they were pitching this for space, but it started as um, kind of a brainwave sensor for bicyclists to try to figure out which intersections are dangerous versus not for city planning design. Um, so you would wear an under bike helmet and sort of traverse the city and then find out sort of which areas cause people stress. And they were talking about maybe using this uh, for space uh, design, though I think it's a lot easier to hide a sensor under a helmet um, than to be walking around for a week sort of measuring people's stress reactions to meeting rooms. But who knows, maybe in the future. All right, so qualitative, and I am going to speed up ever so slightly, but still keep it real. So qualitative tools, I love this picture. It has nothing to do with space design. There's nothing we can do to address cell phone use, but I just walked into a completed space and found a room entirely non-ergonomic, but they all seem to enjoy the chairs. All right, so qualitative aspects. So site observations is something that we do a lot. Um, obviously, it's low barrier to entry. Any space, uh, you can go in and see how it's being used, but we tend to look for these things. Uh, user torture is somewhat uh, pretty easy to understand. Like, what are people trying to accomplish that the space is not helping them with? Uh, conflict, especially in workplace design. Is there any signs up that are marking please be quiet or it's too loud as a signal to maybe this space needs a white noise system or maybe this space should be enclosed or better zoned? Are there any barriers uh, that people are trying to work around and then workarounds in particular? So is there storage under the feature stair because there's no storeroom? Is there um, other things that weren't really considered that could be included in the next design? And then wear patterns, um, this one's harder to see in interior spaces, but definitely we all know in public space, there are spaces where people want to go that are marked by wear patterns in the environment. And a side note about workarounds, um, this is, I guess it's now week five of working remote, but this is from week one, uh, before I realized that Zoom and Teams can support screen share audio and we were trying to have a picture of my 
television via the laptop to a shared call with many books as far as workarounds for space. And then user hacks. So I have a few of these pictures because I really, really enjoy showing them. Um, so user hacks are always signaling like there's something here that could be working better. Um, so this one is the privacy curtain onto a private office um, in a law firm. Top right is a sit-stand desk made out of paper. Um, I don't know exactly how the behavior started or ended in this workspace, but it was on a lot of the desks and I don't know how much paper they went through or whether they ordered it separately. It just asks so many questions. And then bottom right is the increasingly more common IKEA um, crib cover uh, leaves in open offices. And what's crazy about this one is you can go on Amazon now and look up uh, light blocker, cubicle cover, and it will pop up with this IKEA leave. Um, we have done workplace standards for clients where they've asked us to mention it in particular to their facilities teams. And there are reviews about how it works. And it's it's interesting because like, I get it, I've worked in offices with poor lighting and yes, it would be a really good hack, but it really drills home the importance of choice in workplace design. So part of the reason people are hacking their desks is because this is the only place they can work. They have to be there eight or 10 hours a day. They have nowhere else to go. Um, and also fluorescent lights, which generally are starting to phase out. But a lot of things we don't think about is dimming and light control and working those into the project so that the users have the ability to control their environments um, so that this hopefully doesn't continue as a trend. Um, other things that I love, uh, workplace kitchens that are made out of office furniture. Um, bottom left is my favorite. Uh, because they had all the supplies in the top drawer and then the microwave, it was just, it was just really well done. Um, these are in county facilities. <laughs> um, lab design, uh, I have done some lab design. Um, I continue to be fascinated about the bottom right miss, which is that if you are working in a lab, you cannot bring food or drinks inside. Um, you have to leave them outside of the building. And I've been to more completed labs in beautiful spaces. I love this building. Um, it's in, uh, it's at U of T and it's got this lovely atrium, but it's both too bright um, for the needs of the experiment. It adds a variable. So they use what they have on hand, which is a lot of tinfoil to block out the light. And then there's Craigslist furniture in front of every door of every lab on this floor for the drinks that sit outside. So if you're doing lab design, you're on this call, just put a shelf outside the door, just do it. Um, and then this one, HVAC design, um, again, we can't necessarily fix it through architecture, but we work with our engineering friends to try to solve some of these issues. Um, top right is user mounted fans in a working room, in a, in a meeting room. And the bottom right was the most difficult uh, to hang up workshop boards I've ever done um, because the HVAC system, which was just crazy high. Um, I won't get into why that happened. Um, so this one, I'm actually going to skip this question because I'm running a little bit behind as far as unforeseen adaptations. But if you would like to put some user hacks in the mural, go for it. Um, so stakeholder interviews. Uh, this this one, again, barrier to entry is very low, but the insights that we get from talking to the actual users of the space are incredible for informing projects. Um, the top one is a center for autism therapy. And we did a lot of interviews with the practitioners to just sort of understand their day-to-day -day and what sort of spaces they need. This was one where light control and dimming became really important, um, controlling sight lines. You know, they still wanted daylight, but they wanted to make sure that like views to the corridor weren't distracting or they were placed behind uh, the students. And then also just side note, interesting as far as floor patterns. Um, we had a lot of discussions with them as far as should it have a pattern or should it be random? I thought a pattern would be better so the kids could like figure it out and then move on. And they're like, no, 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 it needs to be random. We can't have them like going through that ritual of sort of counting tiles every morning. So it's interesting. Um, bottom one is a school uh, that does uh, project-based learning. So the students are sort of on teams. They change up throughout the year. 
but for them being able to move things around and as high school students to be able to configure your own space was a huge win for them. Um, looking at focus groups and co-creation, so I know a lot of people on this call do a lot of focus groups um, or watching users or usability testing. Some of how we adapt this to architecture is we do the exact same thing you're doing. We do keep, toss, create exercises where we're asking what do you want in the new space, what don't you want, what do you want um, that you haven't ever seen before, that's what the one with these kids is. Um, we tend to do a lot of it's hard to describe space and non-architects um, can sometimes find it difficult to articulate sort of what they want. So sometimes we'll break it into um, what were the interactions that you want to happen? Um, what are the expectations you had coming in? And then what are the space? So if they know what the physical aspect of it, they can put it in space, but sometimes it's easier to articulate the behavior or what they expected to be there instead. And then bottom right is Lego. Um, one, it's novel, so it tends to be fairly engaging um, within workshops, but sometimes we'll actually have people sort of build different options with different colors for different programs and then present it to each other and sort of debate pros and cons. And then dot voting, we also tend to do a lot. So again, it's trying to bridge that, uh, whether it's vocabulary gap or, you know, people don't design spaces a lot. You might do a brand new student sensor once every 20 years. So how do you show what could be in a way that makes it accessible for people to interact with? So we'll often do like a series of photos, um, some of them sort of traditional looking, some of them crazy, some of them in the middle and actually have the users vote like I like this with a green dot, I dislike it with a red and then sort of have conversations around it um, as far as, well, what was it? Was it because that just had a blue wall or was there something in the picture you were looking at? And then this one is one of those gut check uh, exercises. It's, um, we were trying to solve a particular problem with the client and we designed the exercise so that we could get them to kind of co-create their space. So this was a, the client was uh, basically a house that uh, offers housing to families whose children's are, children are in the hospital. But all of their existing sites were homes. They were actually houses. Um, but their new site was going to be one much larger and two spread across many floors in a fairly modern building. So we actually made this chart that had kind of basement, level one, level two, level three, level four. And then we pre-printed post notes, much to the detriment of our older printers, um, that had sort of the names of spaces on them and whether it was public or private. And then actually had them in teams take the spaces and be like, does this belong on level one? Does this need to be repeated three times if we're spread across three levels? Is there anything we need to add um, in blank post-its? And trying to mark those key relationships that formed adjacency diagrams that we then use to develop into plans. And what was nice about this one is we had two teams going. So when they presented, they were able to be like, oh, I really like that idea or I want to adapt this. But we had something that was very easy for us to turn into space following the conversation as opposed to a more general sort of open-ended brainstorming exercise. Um, and then personas and journey mapping. So I personally have done less of this. It does happen um, in architectural design. So the example I have is a little bit more uh, as far as those sort of tricky problem exercises, um, but using similar tools. So this is a project, um, it was for uh, housing micro units with a large shared amenity floor. Um, but the tenant mix uh, was originally going to be students and then it was going to be sort of anyone could live there. So the tricky problem was we had an amenity floor designed for students, you know, might have a pool table and a shared kitchen and some spaces to study or meet um, and fairly informal furniture. But how, what does that amenity floor need when suddenly you might have families, young professionals, um, seniors living in the space? So we designed the study around sort of, we could look at demographic research, sort of who's in the area where this building is going to go. Um, we could benchmark other buildings to see what amenities they're choosing. Um, but also we could take a look at the street 
and what amenities are provided on the street. Because if you have five yoga studios on that street, do you really need a yoga studio up on the amenity floor? You might want something else. So we were trying to figure out, th these images aren't from this project, but an example as far as a gap, like what's in the area and where's the opportunity that might help the building differentiate for future tenants, but also provide a space that would actually be used. We've all seen brand new condo towers that have a beautiful amenity, a gym, a, swimming pool, a dog wash station that just sits empty and lit up at night. I think what we were trying to find on this is like, what what could fill that gap that might be more atypical? And then the last part we were gonna do is actually observations in the neighborhood. Sort of what does that neighborhood feel like on a weekend or a weeknight or a weekday? Who are the people that are there who might be future tenants to try to design that space? And I am gonna skip this one as well. Sorry, guys. All right, so a brief pause. Musings on a pandemic. I forget what my act three was going to be originally, but obviously it's, it's a weird time. Um, there's an elephant like literally right over there in my room that's staring me down with every word I utter to this empty space. Um, that's changing the way of how we work in fundamental ways and changing the way we interact with my favorite types of spaces, public spaces, shared spaces, where we come together. I also love this bottom right sign. I think it was on a CBS, uh, Stay Wicked Fire Pot. So this conversation is not extremely well researched. We are all new to this. It's raw, it's still evolving, but I did wanna share some of the thoughts that are emerging around sort of post COVID and how we think about design. So what comes next? So, and it's funny how this conversation changes every week. I was working on this page last week and I swear every study that I worked on last week was about what happens when we return? How do we maintain distance? How can we take a fairly dense workspace and maybe have everyone sit three seats apart, but also rethinking those offices that have shared seating, um, shared technology. Do we issue everyone a chair with their name on it? Um, protocols and ramping up cleaning, e increasing antimicrobial products in shared spaces for the designs that we have on the board. Um, air cleaning systems, looking at BAS uh, building systems that will show um, live readouts of the status of the filters and how clean the air are. Do we look, when you're talking about airports um, or retail, um, contact last uh, transactions. Is there any additional tech we need to build into the designs that we're working on? Are there quick adaptions we can make for the clients who just opened a space or have an existing space? Um, but also, it also comes back to that core principle of variety and choice and letting people choose how they want to interact with space. I think when we think about those spaces that we really like, I think on the board there's like Grand Central and the Oculus, um, the Liz Gardner Museum, all of those spaces offer you options for how you want to move through it. So you can choose, I just want to cut straight across or I want to wander through. So when we're thinking about spaces post COVID and everyone kind of being at a different headspace, um, keeping in mind that choice and options, do you let some people still stay working at home? Do you do, con do, you do check ins with airports that maybe happen? in the parking lot or at home or do more digital before they have to arrive at the space. Um, offering shoppers choices to pick up or do online, et cetera, so that people can choose their comfort level or emotional safety, because this isn't just how many germs might be on a surface, it's also what surfaces people feel comfortable touching. And then also we're really starting to gather more data because we can do the same research that everyone is doing, but without sort of um, findings on how people are feeling, how they're working now, what spaces they're working in, um, and collecting their opinions on future behaviors. What are the spaces they missed most about the office that might signal what are the most important spaces to get right? Um, and then also uh, Gensler is a global firm and we have offices in Asia that are starting to open back up again. And we are starting to learn also from ourselves as far as what are the behaviors um, that people feel comfortable with and how they work. 
Now these polls I'm not going to skip because uh, we have just started developing this survey and I've got two of the questions here um, that I'm just fascinated by where people are working these days. It's partially current state, but do you actually have an enclosed room? Are you sharing with others? Are you in your living room backed up against a wall with an extra light because the sun's setting? You know, do you have a larger house or roommates? It's it's an interesting time to see. That's funny, it doesn't give a legend unless there's a certain percentage. Whatever space happens to be available. I'm definitely spending more time working on my couch, which is doing nothing for my neck. Um, okay, so that's the one enclosed room. I think that's that seems to be everyone's preferred if it's available at all. Um, Cool. And then there's a second one that I pulled, which was, what do you miss, miss most? As we're, as we're working on these questions, this is the one that I'm just fascinated because that tends to signal like, what are the desirable portions that you really want to get right for that return? Even if the initial return, I wonder if I can change the settings to get that legend back. Oh, maybe not. I will send it to you guys after or post it on the mural. But generally the people is, I think what a lot of people are feeling right now, but definitely the daily schedule and routine is like oddly becoming very important. Um, oh, pull everywhere. Gotta work on its UX. Um, so expanding research. So one thing, if you are interested in this sort of conversation, I think we're publishing articles like every design firm right now, um, every day on sort of what the thinkings are as far as looking at the existing spaces, how you might alter spaces that are currently under designed, um, amenities, and then also big conversations around change management protocols and sort of communicating the return. And that web link I can post in the chat, but it's up top there too. Okay, and then last three, ending on a positive note. Um, so I do firmly believe as someone that cares about users, that this experience has actually changed the conversation a little bit as far as occupant health and well-being. Um, when you think about those IKEA leaves signaling like this space is not working well for my migraines or it's too cold, there's building standards out there um, like the Living Building Challenge, like Well, that we've started reaching for for some of the research on like when you're thinking about occupant health, what is really important to get right? And these are standards that take more than just how efficient are the lights, how efficient is the water, um, it takes into, is the space inspiring? Um, is it human? Does it have nice air quality? But does it provide good nourishment and light and comfort um, and sort of stimulate occupants that are within it? So I'm kind of excited that some of these conversations are definitely coming a bit more out of the woodwork. And then the second one, because I'm Canadian and I don't know how many times I've watched this video in the last week. Um, shout out Canada. Um, so I highly recommend if you haven't watched it, the Queen did a very good and uh, very calming speech, as far, which as someone that is not 90s years old who has been through multiple wars, it's comforting, like better days will come back. We will occupy our cities again. We will meet again, but also, Recognize that we never really know what users are going to do with what they are given. <laughs> but by informing them, we can head towards more informed and successful solutions. And I do think that projects where you involve the users, they come into the space when you finish it and they're like, I helped build this. It responds to what I needed. And maybe it's not what we would have thought the users needed as architects, but it, it works better for them. But then you also get the fun fact of like, this is what people are actually doing in the space. But the cat one is my favorite. Um, it's really good. And that's all I had. Um, my last picture here is just, it's really good UX for what these four people want to do. Um, this is outdoor space in Florence. Um, but yeah, we will pause for questions. Todd, I went a little over time, but not sure no, if you want to do it 
in chat or with microphones? Who are you thinking? Yeah, so I, I collected questions from people. Oh, great. Um, and so I can post them to you and, and or read them out. Uh, maybe we'll do both. Reading them out might so, be easier. Oh, great. Lamp over Yeah, Andrea head. asks, uh, who's during your, the research phase, who's paying for the utilization data analysis? Oh, we do it for free. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> often it, it depends on the scale of the project. So if it's a really big project, um, doing strategy and research will often be part of our pitch. Um, so it's included, we try to have a user study to inform a lot of our projects and it tends to be sort of all part of the package deal. Um, for other projects, like some of those quick hits, um, it might be something where maybe a question has popped up with your client that you didn't anticipate and then you might will offer to do a study and we'll put together like an additional fee or a service for that. Um, for some of the smaller stuff that we do a lot of, like the, the workplace survey tool that we use, um, because it's easier for us to set it up and we have standard questions available, sometimes we will roll it into existing projects um, without adding that service depending on the scale. But it, it really varies. Um, we are a client facing industry, so, I think the short answer to that would be it depends. Um, and then some of the research that we do, like the workplace research, um, Gensler has a grant program internally, and we actually devote funds to different research projects every year. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, the next question is from Daniel, mm -hmm. and Daniel asks, let me paste this here. Has there been any prominent work and or research done about addressing noise in urban centers? Ooh, none that I have heard of, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, I know there's a lot of studies related to light pollution and its effect on people in cities. And there's definitely a ton of research related to inside noise, um, especially in office design, occupants, sound transfer, um, also in neurodiverse conversations as far as whether you're designing for autism or introverts or extroverts. Um, there's a lot related to that, but unfortunately I don't know of any related to noise pollution in cities in particular. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. All right, and then next question is, for some reason, Zoom chat doesn't behave the way I expect it, go figure. Uh, Susan asks, do you or Gensler ever research about the impact of workplace design on office culture, and how do you take that into account when designing or redesigning a space? Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's as someone that does a fair amount of workplace design projects, it's, the really interesting ones are the ones where we're able to really understand our clients and their culture and design the space around that. So I don't know if we do studies related to like what is your culture, but we do a lot of questions, um, whether it's in focus groups or survey analysis related to um, we call it design experience. So what are the aspects? Do I feel like I belong? Does my, um, how often do I talk to my manager or other colleagues to try to get at side aspects of culture as far as like how interactive are they? How individual are they? What sort of spaces do they interact with? Um, but it's, it's similar to architecture in the way that you can't sort of straight out ask what space do you want? just as you can't really ask, what culture do you have? So we try to design the questions as far as, do they tend to be more collaborative, more individual, because those tend to feed a little bit more into space, but it definitely, um, understanding their brand and sort of who they are and how they interact and how they work is really important to get their space right. Um, without sort of coming out and being like, are you collaborative or, um, do you respect people like it? We don't do as much when it comes to sort of employee experience survey, like a Gallup survey, but we try to relate it more to how they work. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next one is from Rachel. Are there any examples of AB type testing outside of the retail context? 
and especially those where sales or revenue is not the key success metric? Mm. Uh, the main project I know about is retail, but I have heard of bits and pieces within healthcare um, where you might take a uh, waiting room, configure it in one way versus another, um, or sort of rearrange the furniture or try different things within the space, um, different ways of checking in. Um, with, with the hospital project that we were doing interactions with, we were considering doing some engagements where we would reconfigure part of the cafeteria or reconfigure um, part of the sort of central waiting area or the ER zone. Um, that project is still ongoing, so hopefully at some point um, we get to do some of that testing as it moves sort of more into a phased master plan. But definitely retail, the incentive is really well aligned um, to check sort of, did I have more sales? Did more people come in the door? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ali asks, do you know when apps will open for Gensler's 2021 DSD program? <laughs> um, unfortunately, the DSD program is uh, slightly dormant. Um, for anyone who's not aware of it, it's the design strategist development program. Um, for five years, we were bringing people in from a variety of backgrounds um, to be embedded in our consulting studios and then sort of work on projects. Um, I was actually a graduate of that program. Unfortunately, it's, uh, we're no longer taking applicants for it. It's actually shifted more internal focus. So we're taking some of the programming and sort of moving it around to some of the people that are here. Um, but for sure, keep an eye on postings. It's a global firm. We're always looking for people. Great, thank you. Uh, Rachel asks, has, has any of your design research used the concept of the extreme user? And what are some examples? I do not have a good example for that, but one of my colleagues is doing a lot of research on inclusive design as far as designing for the extremes, because if you can get the extremes right, the middle will work out for everybody as opposed to designing for the average. Um, looking at sort of accessibility and different types of users, um, but at a risk of cribbing her research. Um, I don't know a ton about it, um, but I do know we accessibility conversations and neurodiverse conversations and designing for um, less average users is definitely becoming more a part of the conversation lately. Great. And Okay, the old bear asks, <laughs> do some building types lend themselves more to a UX driven approach? Uh, that one it tends to be, again, because we are very client facing, um, it's when those incentives really align well. So healthcare has a very user driven approach, community spaces, whether that's libraries, public spaces, lobbies, um, anything that's faced to the public um, tends to like doing understanding the users tends to arise sort of intuitively when you're talking about sort of labs or factories or um, spaces that are less focused on people it tends to be more of a side conversation if at all and then workplace as I mentioned it's uh, parallel incentives so their businesses making business decisions looking to understand uh, their people before they green light a project. So there's definitely a lot of interest within workspace. But I would say like the reason the majority of the examples were workspace, healthcare, or sort of amenity in public space is because those tend to be the ones where you're designing for a wider variety of people. Shane asks <laughs> several questions, but I'm gonna pick only one. Okay. Does service design thinking come into play on any projects? Uh, less so on the ones I have worked on, but uh, definitely within our brand teams um, and hospitality teams, as far as hotels, restaurants, retail, uh, service design, touch points, um, key moments within the user journey definitely comes up more and more often. Um, my work tends to have been mainly the types of projects I've been talking about, so a little bit less, but we're definitely hearing the language a lot more. Uh, how do you account for accessibility when designing? 
Yeah, that one, you could do a whole another hour talk on it, and it's fascinating. I would say accessibility, um, we tend to, as architects, and I'm generalizing here, um, we tend to think about the code first, so the building code, the rules that we have to follow, which contain quite a few um, requirements related in particular to wheelchairs, um, some requirements related to the blind. It's the reason we mm. have braille on buttons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then depending on where you're working, um, Canada has different codes than the US, et cetera. So we start with that, but there's definitely, um, as someone that has worked on projects for the autistic and a little bit in healthcare, um, there's a big recognition no, no, these days you. that the base requirements could be better and that we could widen the approach again thinking about those extreme users whereas if if you can design a space that works for someone who is autistic and someone who is in a motorized wheelchair everybody else in the middle gets those benefits as well whether it's the ability to control light or a wider ramp or a door that has a push button on it um, if you're doing more inclusive design, it definitely expands the uh, usability for any type of user. And then there's a lot of conversations related to, we don't necessarily have to design for permanent disability because everyone might cycle through a temporary disability, which is an, such as uh, being on crutches or um, that sort of thing. So designing for a wider spectrum is generally seen as a public good and it's definitely emerging more in conversations and, and our projects. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, last question from T. Kirk. Now this one is a bit, uh, a little complicated, but uh, <laughs> I sometimes find sustainability and energy efficiency drive clients go against allowing users to control their own space. How do you see, you know, when do you um, run into this argument and do you, does your research ever help weigh things like energy efficiency versus what people actually want? Mm -hmm. Oh, I know there's architects on the line that just swallowed hard, same as me. Um, mm -hmm. So sustainability is a really big goal and buildings use a lot of energy and there has been some really good pushes to make buildings more sustainable. When I showed the, the newer building standards, these sort of um, well and living building standard, you'll see that they have sustainability requirements within them, but they also have an emphasis on sort of user comfort, um, light, and then generally it always comes back to choice and variety and the ability to control your environment. I think this pops up in UX as well, like can I configure it to what I need? versus what's sort of the most efficient design that we can do. And I think for that one, definitely as architects, we are all working in offices that are sustainable designs because we practice what we preach, but we understand that in some conditions, it might be way too cold or way too hot because you're using less of an HVAC system and it might lack controls on lighting. But I think similar to inclusion, um, the conversation is changing a lot about can we still be efficient, but also uh, can we still be efficient, but also have the ability to bring in that choice and control to give the users more play within their space. But definitely, I like uh, if I hadn't remembered to get my sweater off my chair at work, I would be freezing in my house. Like I, I understand where it comes from, and we're definitely. Uh, always trying to do better on that, especially in workplace design. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Erin. This was amazing. <laughs> we really appreciate you, uh, you know, being the speaker for Boston Kai's first online meeting. And I'd also like to thank everybody else who attended for being really engaged, especially those of you who are brave enough to be on video, as well, and also everybody who participated in the mural activity at the beginning. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, all the links that were posted in the chat, as well as some of the upcoming events, um, and a sign up link for Boston Kai's mailing list, if you want to you know, get on that uh, to hear about other events, as well as our own. Um, and thank you very much. I hope you all have a safe and healthy rest of your quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming.
Thank you.